Go and tell the world the party's over. Get your house in order for the coming of the sun. The good news is that when the party's over for the world, celebration for the saints has just begun. The old king gave a party, brought the vessels of the Lord. They drank till nobody there was sober. What really stopped the band was when God sent a hand that wrote upon the wall, the party's over. Go and tell the world the party's over. Get your house in order for the coming of the sun. The good news is that when the party's over for the world, celebration for the saints has just begun. Some people think that life is just a party. Forget tomorrow, live it up, they say. But if they'll look around, they'll see the ship is going down. The lifeboat's waiting, get on board today. Go and tell the world the party's over. Get your house in order for the coming of the sun. The good news is that when the party's over for the world, celebration for the saints has just begun. The good news is that when the party's over for the world, celebration for the saints has just begun. Good morning, everybody. There's a little bit of feedback. Too loud. It's good. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about a guy I listened to about 25 years ago. His name is David Ring. He's got cerebral palsy, and basically, uh, the doctors told him that. He's never going to be normal. He's never going to do... He's not normal by any stretch, but they told him he's never going to do any of the things that he's doing. Is that a miracle? I believe that's a miracle. Maybe he did not get physically healed, but when you listen to him preach, he talks with a... He's got a speak, speech impediment. Like, he can't... He's jerky when he moves, and, and yet you understand every word he says, even though it's not very clear, but you still know what he's talking about. And this guy, I listened to about, I was still at Southland Farm down in Piney there, and he was giving his testimony, and he was telling us of a song, a hymn, and he hates that hymn, he says. I don't like that hymn, he goes. Go, Lord, give me a cabin in the corner of glory land. He says, ah, yuck, I don't want no cabin in the corner of glory land. I want my mansion. <laughs> so he wants a mansion. And then he proceeded to start singing a song, and believe me, he cannot sing. So never depend on your ability. It's your availability that counts. He started singing, and there wasn't a dry eye in that place. If you ever know, want to know what the anointing is, that was anointing. So just because you think you can't sing, that doesn't mean you can't be anointed, an anointed singer. And he proceeded to sing the song, and it was beautiful. And this was the song he started out. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary. To save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning. Of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins. And won the victory. Victory, everybody. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew. And all my love is due him. He 
He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. That's the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. He has changed us. Attitudes change. Lives change. Don't underestimate the power of Christ. It's already in play. It's already, it's here. It's with us. Since Christ died, this power is available to all of us. And we can plug into it. We can have the mind of Christ. We can do things, change things. Just focus on yourself first. Judge yourselves first. And then proceed to go tell others about this. And then he always said this. I have cerebral palsy. What's your excuse? So what he's saying is he can't even walk properly. He can't speak properly. He's preaching the gospel. He's a motivational speaker, evangelist. And he goes around telling people about Jesus. And what's our excuse? And here's a, a little uh, excerpt from, from uh, Oswald Chambers. To have a master and a teacher is not the same thing as being mastered and taught. Having a master and a teacher means that there is someone who knows me better than I know myself, who is closer than a friend, who understands the remotest depths, the remotest depths of my heart and is able to satisfy them fully. It means having someone who has made me secure in the knowledge that he has met and solved all my doubts, uncertainties, and problems in my mind. To have a master and a teacher is this and nothing less. For one is your teacher, even Christ. He is my teacher. Is he your teacher also? If not, make him your teacher. You can learn so much from him. Uh, this uh, was two little rabbit trails that I have. This is my message here is, was... It was really a tough one because I, uh, the way the, I, I, I get to it in a second here. Uh, when he laid it upon my heart, I, was, I wasn't confused, but I, was, I, was, uh, I didn't know what to say. But I'll start with this. When Jesus was here on earth, he preached for three years and got very few people converted. Very few. They actually, they, they, they crucified him. He managed to offend many, though, but the converts were very few. That doesn't mean he did not sow a lot of seeds. Anyway, going back to my message, the Lord laid a scripture on my heart. Uh, Tuesday night, I was sitting, and, and, and it just came to me. Now, you might ask how you know the Lord laid it on your heart. Well, I live a life of faith, so I choose to believe the Lord laid it on my heart. And if you, li if you live by faith, that's how you have to say it, and that's how it is. The Lord laid it upon my heart, and to write it down. So I wrote it down, or copied and pasted it onto my tablet here. And then I kept, I pondered it, read it over and over, and it made sense to me, but I didn't know how to proceed in making a, a message out of that. So I went to bed, at one o'clock I woke up and I got an answer. It was really, I was blessed by it. And again, this message, I'm not gonna say this is the only way it is, this is how it is gonna be, but have an open mind to it. Open your hearts and see how uh, God can, uh, can work this out in this way. Uh, the, the Bible is full of allegories. Uh, you take um, Isaac, Abraham and Isaac. It's an allegory to, to, to Jesus and the cross. It's, the Bible is very allegorical. There's a lot of, uh, uh, actually most of it is. You can, you can take examples from the Old Testament and they, re they happen again. So if it happened before, it'll happen again. If, if uh, there was a resurrection once at Jesus, there was going to be one again. So the scripture that I had, that's, it was out of Matthew 27, uh, verse 52 and 53. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which, which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now think of that for a little moment. Just allow yourself to go into the thought process of what happened there in Jerusalem when these people came out of their graves and appeared unto many. Can you imagine the effect if pretend it's you now, some dead relative you have came out of the grave and came to your house and you're not saved and he's telling you, 
you need to turn to this Jesus. Can you imagine the effect it would have on you? Now you cannot say, this is uh, your imagination. This is now something that's going to happen. It's happened, and it's going to happen again. And I'm going to prove it to you. Like you take uh, Abraham, Abraham in, uh, uh, sacrificing of Isaac, allegorical. Uh, the days of Noah and the return of Jesus, Sodom and Gomorrah, they're allegorical to the return of Christ. Uh, just like in those days, it'll be just like when the Son of Man comes. So that there is always an allegory that you can uh, compare coming events to that have already happened in the Bible. Now, if you, if you would combine this verse, when the graves were opened, the one I just read, with the account of Acts chapter 2, it turned the world upside down. Now you remember, all those people that came out of the graves, Jesus did not make a huge difference as far as converting Christ, people is concerned. But now something happened. People came out of their graves, and Acts 2 happened right after. Not long after, maybe 40 days after, maybe 50 days. But it was within the same time frame. And they turned this world upside down. And so, and so, uh, so much, well, well, first of all, severe persecution followed. They could not freely just go, even though they did, preach the gospel. They were, they were killed for it. They were martyred for it. And that, uh, when the former rain was, was poured out, they did mighty signs, mighty wonders, and thousands upon thousands came to Jesus, which before, that didn't happen. And now all of a sudden, two events happened. A resurrection and a former reign. In Acts 2, verse 1 to 4, is the description of the former reign of the, the day of Pentecost. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. That's saying a lot. They were all in one accord. Can we say that now? We're all in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it set upon each of them as they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This was followed also by severe persecution and martyrdom. And also an explosion of people coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, turning, repenting. And I strongly believe this is allegorical to what's going to happen next. What? Now jump ahead a couple of thousand years. So will this event happen again? Well, let's study the word. Let's go into to, uh, uh, I've lost my scripture here. I think it is uh, Revelation 7, verse 9 to 14. And after this, I beheld in low a great multitude which no man could number. And remember, there was another set, another group in, I think, chapter 4 or 5, which he could number. He said it was thousand times thousand times thousands of, uh, uh, th thousand times thousand and thousands of thousands. Here, this group, he couldn't number. He, he said, and, and, and of, uh, of all nations, kindreds, t uh, people, and tongues stood before the throne and before the lame, clothed with white robes, palms in their hands and crying with, loud, with a loud voice, say, salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne and upon the lame. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, amen, blessed and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto him, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? Where, where are they from? And I said unto him, Sir, you know. And, and he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. So basically, these are the ones that Satan made war against and he prevailed. So they, were, they died, they were martyred. So where do these people all of a sudden come from? You look at the world situation that we have now, you, are, you talk with anybody, they already have their mind set. Their mind is made up on what, what is true, what they believe in. You can't argue. Even with, with most believers, we can't argue too much with them because everybody believes what they believe in. But there's an event coming that will change everybody's mind. 
And I'm not talking about the latter rain, but I believe in the latter rain. But I, I believe it's going to be together with the rapture or right after. And the reason is this, why I believe that. It'll be allegorical of the first event. First, there was a resurrection. Saints walked out, and then the rapture came. The rapture came, and then there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which changed the world. This is going to happen again. And the reason why I say it's going to happen again in this way is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the latter rain. We do not know how much time there is between the rapture and, and the start of the tribulation. It can be seven years. It can be 40 days. The, 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 the start of the tribulation is, is started by a signature. That's the Antichrist signing a peace treaty. That's what starts the tribulation, not the rapture. So there is a time frame between the rapture and the tribulation. I don't know how long. Like I said, it could be 40 days, it could be seven years. And where I get the seven years from is there's a war in Ezekiel 39. That when the war is done, Israel is burning weapons for seven years. And that's not in the tribulation. And that war hasn't happened yet. So there is a time frame there, either 40 days or seven years, one of the two. But the way, if, if the Bible is allegorical, the way I explained it here before, that there is, there was a resurrection and the former reign, there's going to be a resurrection and the latter reign. And that will, my friends, change minds and hearts because every baby that's been aborted, every one that has died in Christ will rise. They will get out of their graves. They could, they, just like Jesus was 40 days with his glorified body, just because the Bible says, in, it says in, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, Behold, I show you a mystery. Why is it a mystery? We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall rise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And the other, the other uh, example I have is the ten virgins. When the midnight cry was made, the five virgins, it was too late for the five foolish ones, but they could communicate to the five foolish ones. So there was a communication that was made. So this could happen, this will happen again. You will not rise from your grave and go straight to heaven. You'll have a choice. Maybe you, you'll have the choice of doing it, but I believe you will go talk to your loved ones, especially if they're lost. You will be able to communicate to the foolish that you need to go, they couldn't sell there. Uh, oil lamp because they had just enough for themselves. They had to go and get and take their portion with the hypocrites, which is the unbeliever. So there, if you are put into the tribulation, you will have to now give your life, or you will have, the, the only way out into heaven is, is death, because the Bible says uh, Satan made war against the saints, and he prevailed. And then the other scripture I have here is first... Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. I didn't give it to Brandon, but we're all very familiar with this scripture. It's, is this, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then in the second, second Thessalonians also it says there, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. Then shall the wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The reason I mentioned this scripture is there's at least seven years here in this scripture, and yet it looks like the event is all condensed together, but it's not. You can see the Lord only destroys the Antichrist that is returned. But here it happens, the rapture, and it says the Lord destroyed him with the brightness of his coming. So there's a seven-year timetable here that we can read about. That's why I'm saying between the rapture and the beginning and the, 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 what starts the, 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 the tribulation, we do not know how much time is there. All I do know is this. The tribulation starts by a signature of the Antichrist signing a peace treaty with Israel. And that's what actually begins the tribulation. And again, like I said, take this with, with a, a grain of salt. Oh, study it, show it for yourself. Uh, see if it makes sense. You know, with other scripture, you always want to compare it, that all scripture makes sense. And I believe this is how it's going to happen. And this concludes my part of 
the message. And Brother Dave will now take over. So we're going to have the rapture soon. Hallelujah. Thank you. I once asked a person, how's she going? Nothing the rapture couldn't solve. <laughs> I thought that was a good answer. Nothing the rapture couldn't solve. Are you ready for the rapture? Deep down, I mean, do you know that you know? I mean, it's not going to be a joke. Once those uh, uh, women, or the women with those lamps, they started knocking. It was too late. They thought they had it. They had lamps. They had all the trappings, but when the door was locked, God said, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. So I want to speak today on the scripture to your heart. Do you know who you are? When you look on YouTube, there's more and more confusion in what Christianity is. I was listening to a prayer breakfast in Washington put on by Franklin Graham. Billy Graham had a prayer breakfast speech. And let me tell you, that was in 1964. That was quite a speech. I'm telling you, he did not mince words. We are all lost. We need the Savior. If we don't, there is an eternal, uh, eternal separation waiting. And he didn't talk to ordinary people. They were all of them were high government people and they listened to him and he gave them the scripture from A to B on how to get saved just like you would talk to somebody who just heard the gospel now. Some of them didn't like it, you noticed. In 1965, they pulled out a cigarette and they smoked to ease their conscience. But that was pretty interesting. John chapter 1, verse 1. I'll read out of the Living Testament. In the beginning, the Word already existed. What's the Word? The Bible? No. Jesus is the Word. I am the way, I am the truth, and the life, and I am the Word. It says, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God created everything. He created everything. And guess what? Every, he created everything, and nothing was created except through him. So it was Jesus that created everything. That's why the Bible says there's only one way into the kingdom, and that's through Jesus, because everything belongs to him. The word gave life to everything that was created. The very life in you was created by Jesus. His life brought life, light to everyone. Did Jesus bring that light to you yet? Those listening by the internet, have you got the light? 
Some people think they have light, but the scripture speaks like this. If the light in you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? They think they have light. There's only one light, and that's Jesus Christ. It says the light shines in darkness, and darkness cannot extinguish it. Over the years, the hundreds of thousands of years, they've tried to extinguish the light. It's still burning brightly, ever more so. So many of God's children who bear that light have been martyred and killed, but to no avail. The light will stay until the end. And in John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, he came to his own, and his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them give he the power. I love that word. He gave you the power to become the sons of God. He put the ball in your park. You now have a choice. Once you hear the gospel, do I receive this Jesus as my Savior or don't I? I got a choice. It says he gave you the power. He gave you the choice to make the choice whether you want Jesus or not. And today, Many are ridiculing that. You can see it, but God says, my word is above my name, and what the word says, it is simply written. It will never go away. So, he says, he gives them the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It doesn't say pray all night. It doesn't say do good works. What does it say? He that believes on his name. A knowledge in your heart that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. That's the only thing that will make a difference between hell and heaven for a person. Have you made that choice? Do you know that you know that you believe in his name, not just believe that he is a figure out there born 2,000 years ago. No, believing he has the power to change his life, your life. Believing he has the power to give you eternal life. Believing he is willing that none perish and all that come to him, he says, I will in no wise cast out. That's the God we serve. But he gives you a choice. Yes, we have lots of good messages in the Bible, but God gives you a choice. And you have to make that choice first before the rest of the Bible will click in. That's the first stepping stone. If you don't hit that stepping stone, you miss the whole thing. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So, in John chapter 1, verse 14, so the Word became human. Very interesting. He became human being. Why? So he would qualify. He became like us to take on our punishment. The punishment that we deserve, he took upon himself the Bible teaches a man is dead 
in trespasses and sin and on his way to hell, regardless how good you are, regardless what job you have, regardless what your religion is. You are dead in trespasses and sin. So the word became human and made his home amongst us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. I want you to keep this in mind, his only begotten Son. But there's more coming. And the question is, are we the begotten sons of God? Many people will mock at it, but the word of God does not. We either are God's children or we're not. The question is for every person to ask in his heart, do I belong to God? And if it's a maybe, I hope so, I wish so, it's not good enough. You've got to know that you know that you belong to your father. In your earthly father, when somebody asks you, who is your father? Is uh, Mr. So-and-so your father? Well, I hope so. I hope he is. I think so. No, that's not what we say. When somebody asks me, is Shorty your father? I say, sure, he's my father. I don't think so, I don't hope so, I know for a fact. Shorty, by the way, that's his nickname. Shorty was my father. He's the one that consummated with my mother, and through them I was created. So I got only one father on this earth, and that's my father. So. Is Jesus your father? If you don't know for sure, make sure you do. Go get to know him. Get on your face before him and find out whether really God is your father. In Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 10, For it became him whom are all things, and by whom are all things in the beginning, many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So he became our salvation through suffering. Jesus suffered horribly. The Bible teaches us that drops of blood fell from his face as he fought the battle for your soul and mine. He was in a death grip with Satan, but hallelujah, he won. He got up and said, it says, for the joy that was set before him, he went willingly to the cross. The battle was won in Gethsemane, and the cross fulfilled it. We are now saved by his grace through what he did, not what we did. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctifies, sanctified are all one of one. Isn't that beautiful? That's hard for a lot of people to understand. The one that's sanctified is Jesus, right? That's what the Bible teaches. The one that sanctifies, it says for both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all one of one. We're all been made one. And this is why it says, for this which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. 
I got a few brothers left. Most of them died, but they were my brothers. Why? They came from the same father. Do you, are, are we all brothers and sisters here? Is Jesus our father? We better know that. It's better be something that is in your heart for sure, not something that you hope, not something that you think, but something that you know. Jesus said, these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So if you ask somebody, are you going to heaven? And the person says, I hope so. That's not good enough. The Bible says, or should I say, <coughs> it is written, it is written that you may know that you have eternal life. So turn to this God, for he is willing none perish. And he's not going to give up on you till you draw your last breath. Those who are listening through the internet, he wants us all in heaven. For the Lord came not to condemn us, but to save us. Hallelujah. Let the Lord open your heart to this and make you a blessing. Amen. <laughs> Is your name written there on those pages bright and fair? Is your name written in the book of life? If you want to be there, then down here you must prepare. Then your name will be in the book of life. Get down on your knees and pray. You from sin must turn away. Or your name Christ once said that from sin you must repent so your name could be in the book of life. You will have a great surprise if you fail to recognize that your name must be in the book of life. Get down on your knees and pray you from sin must turn away. 